and the effect of CO2 itself has to occur. It must increase the radiative heat forcing on the system. That's just what it does from simple physics. The question is, what happens to the big greenhouse component of the real atmosphere? Climate models are the red there. They say that that increases even more, so that CO2 has this added effect, this positive feedback from uh, uh, the uh, climate models from the clouds and so on. But what if in nature there is actually a mitigating effect? That when you warm up the system, something happens with clouds and water vapor that actually cools the earth. Well, my colleague Roy Spencer actually builds data sets to answer specifically that question. And here is what he found. On the left are over a thousand climate model runs about how this feedback works. In every case, those climate models said when you warm up the air with carbon dioxide, the clouds, or anything, anything, doesn't have to be carbon dioxide, the clouds feed back even more warming. Now, it's a little odd because it's on the left, but that means more warming on the left. The real observed data is on the right. Not one single model can reproduce the fact that when you warm up the atmosphere, clouds respond in such a way as to allow the planet to cool. These are hard measurements from global orbiting satellites that we have. So, when you take the theoretical climate models on the pink, you see this rapid warming over the next hundred years. When you take the empirical models, and these are many different people that have done them, the empirical models based upon real data, you find uh, much, much, much less warming that occurs as a result of this uh, uh, CO2 increase. What about polar regions and polar bears? This is always a popular topic. This is a, a time series the last 1,500 years of the um, Arctic, I believe, in, in, in the uh, um, Russian Arctic. And what you see is ups and downs and so on. And sure enough, in this particular picture, I'll, I'll point at the bottom one here, you see a rise sort of in the last 100 years. But it starts from the coldest point in the last 1,500 years. And it's certainly not as warm as it was even 1,000 years ago when uh, change is more rapid and higher occurred. So naturally, the world can make a warming Arctic. If you go back 10,000 years ago, this is the Greenland ice core record. You see that 1,000 years ago, that peak right there, right there. But here you see a 4,000 year period in which the climate did not, or, or Greenland was much warmer than it is today, and Greenland did not melt. That's an important point. Greenland did not melt when for 4,000 years it was much warmer than it is today. Let's go further south now. Uh, this is the equator, East Africa. I, I lived there for a while, and uh, Kilimanjaro certainly has been losing ice. As you can see in this bottom lower left, it's 1880. It has uh, lost quite a bit, nearly all of it actually, since uh, first recorded in 1880. And it shows you that, that glaciers are pretty bad thermometers, as it turns out. They're not very good at telling you the temperature because so many things affect them. But I did build a data set, it took a lot of effort, of East African temperatures the last 100 years. This will be published in about three months. That shows no temperature change there in East Africa, despite what you have been told about uh, certainly Kilimanjaro's melting because of temperature rises. That's not happening. It's melting because of other reasons that happen in that part of the world. Let's go to the far south, the Antarctic sea ice here. It, uh, there's a lot of sea ice in the wintertime, so it's high, then it goes down the next year in the summer, and then up winter, down summer, and so on. Sea ice expands and contracts each year. Uh, two weeks after the Arctic reached its lowest sea ice extent in September of 2007, the Antarctic reached its maximum extent, so that when you added them together, the globe had the same amount of sea ice that it had 30 years ago. So the sea ice in the last um, period has been, or last 30 years has been expanding. Polar bears, people like to talk about polar bears, and they were declining in population. In 1960s, they were down to six to 10,000 is all there were. It was mainly due to the introduction of snowmobiles and high-powered rifles. But two Marine Mammal Protection Acts were enacted, and that set quotas and really saved the day for the polar bears. And today, there are 24,200 at one estimate. You could probably do that plus or minus 2,000 on that. And Canada allows 800 legal kills per year of their polar bears to keep their populations healthy. They do that based upon a scientific analysis of um, uh, the evidence there. So they're pretty upset that the United States has put the polar bears on threatened species because to them they are not. 
Uh, so, scientifically speaking, polar bears are not threatened species. Sea level will rise rapidly as Greenland melts. Sea level has been rising all the time, long time since the last ice age, and it's rising at about one inch per decade right now. The one inch per decade is not your problem. It's the 20 feet that comes in six hours with the next hurricane. That's your problem. And if you are able to withstand that, you can take care of climate change, which means I tell my people who want to build on the Alabama Gulf Coast, that's not a smart thing to do because another hurricane will come. There's just no doubt about that. But sea level has not been rising in an accelerated manner. You see, this is the latest results. Sea level uh, has been flat, actually, for the last three years uh, from the satellite measurements of sea level. So these notions that sea level is rising at an increasing rate just do not pan out. In fact, the Landsat images of Bangladesh shows that it has increased in land area. It's an alluvial plain uh, over the last 32 years. It is not going away. Bangladesh is not drowning. And Greenland was warmer in the past, and it did not melt. Dangerous weather is becoming more frequent and more intense. I hear that a lot at global warming uh, seminars and so on. We can count tornadoes. All science is numbers. We can count tornadoes. They are not increasing in frequency or intensity. Hurricanes are not increasing in intensity or frequency. In fact, this is a, a global view, and a blue line is a northern hemisphere. We have good measurements now, the northern hemisphere hurricane activity. It actually reached its all-time low just a, a few months ago uh, in terms of intensity. So, so far, I've shown that global surface temperature is rising, but in a way inconsistent with model projections. Sea ice, uh, sea level is rising because ice is melting, uh, but it's only one inch per decade, and severe weather is not becoming more frequent or extent. But I want to talk about energy for my last part here. Please don't demonize energy, because without energy, life is brutal and short. Without energy, life is brutal and short. Uh, I was a missionary in Africa. I taught at Neary Baptist High School, physics and chemistry for the students there. Great time, wonderful experience, because the people were, uh, meant so much to me at that point. But I want to show you their energy system. They look at a forest. That's the energy. The energy transmission system are the backs of women. The UN estimates 3.1 miles a day, one way. Put about 45 pounds of wood on the back, they chop take it back. And here's the tragic part, I hope you can see it in the bottom ones. The energy use, it's burned wood in their homes. And I hope you can see that smoke there because I've been in many homes like this in Africa. The UN estimates between 1.8 million and 5.2 million children die each year because of that energy system. You and I would not stand for that, but that's what they're living with now and they're not going to stand for it either. And I want you to know this, one thing I did learn while living in Africa, that African parents love their children as much as you and I do. And African parents, and I've seen this, grieve deeply whenever their child is lost. They're not going to stand for that. And I'm not telling you that story to, to, to move your heartstrings, but to tell you that the demand for energy is going to rise. It's just going to happen because energy, without energy, life is brutal and short. So now we have a dilemma. Suppose you don't agree with me at all about what climate change is, but you say, I want to do something about climate change, global warming or whatever. At the same time, reduce CO2 emissions and meet significant growth in energy demand. Energy demand is going to rise. Well, I'll tell you what California did. They forced a limit on emissions from light duty vehicles. AB 1493 was the code and it was supposed to make 43 mile per gallon cars by 2016. 11 northeastern states adopted it. There was a trial in federal court, Burlington, Vermont, in April and May 2007. I appeared as an expert witness for the Alliance for Automobile Manufacturers. I did it for free. I took vacation to do this. So I, I, I paid for my uh, ability to be part of this trial. And uh, because it was an interesting scientific question for me. Uh, what happens? Well, my, the bulk of my testimony, the guts of my testimony was this. Let's assume that's going to be the temperature rise for the next 100 years. I don't believe it. The data already show this is too high, it's wrong, but let's assume that's going to happen. That's what happens when the entire country puts this AB 1493 into place. Let me back it up. I'm going to overlay, not take off, overlay the effect if the entire country adopts this bill. It's less than a hundredth of a degree after 100 years. No effect, in other words. In fact, if the entire world adopted this program, this bill, it would be undetectable at three hundredths of a degree. Global temperature changes by that, more than that from day to day. 